Welcome to the Take Charge Advanced Care Planning Workshop. We're grateful to be able to present this information to you today on video thanks to the support of the Family Caregiver Alliance and the California Department of Health Care Services. As we begin, I just want you to take a moment to consider why does this conversation matter to you today? What matters to you about learning about this information? What experiences might you have had with serious illness or the death of a loved one that might inform why you want to learn more about this and speak to others about what matters for your care? Because knowing these things as a starting point as we go through this content will make it more relevant for you and will make it more possible for you to communicate why this is so important to you when you come to talk with others. I'm Mary Matisse and the Chief Strategy Officer with Mission Hospice and Home Care, one of the original and still not-for-profit hospices in Northern California. I've been teaching advanced care planning and end-of-life issues for over 20 years, from sacred dying to sudden death and organ donation. And I'm proud to work with a hospice that considers this education so important to the care of what matters most for our patients and community. I'll be joined in this session training with you with Christina Irving from the Family Caregiver Alliance. Christina is a licensed clinical social worker and has worked with families for many years in the San Francisco Bay Area from supporting their information and access to care through their coordination of care and with Gwen Harris from Seniors at Home. Gwen has a master's in gerontology and has been teaching palliative care and working with geriatric patients for decades. Between us all, we have different perspectives on the reason and the support and the needs for taking charge of this area of your life, and we look forward to sharing this information with you. The goals of our teaching to help you understand the need to take charge of your advanced care planning in four simple steps. To help you identify some of the things that matter most to you for your future care. To learn some of the myths and facts that are important to understanding the language used in medicine and in end of life care planning to help you come up with some strategies of ways that you can start this conversation with your family, with your friends, and with your healthcare professionals. And finally, we hope this information helps you actually complete the documents required to communicate to the systems and your healthcare team what matters most to you. In order to support this information, we have online resources for you, which you'll see on the slide, at www.missionhospice.org forward slash take charge. You'll find the take charge toolkit there, which will go through the four steps in this workshop, a sample of the California Advanced Healthcare Directive, a physician order for life sustaining treatment, and the conversation starter kit. All of these documents will be referenced in this course and it will be useful for you to go to the website and download those or make sure that someone does that for you. And before I get into the rest of the content, I just want to let you know that Christina and Gwen and I, as much as we are facilitators of this content for you in this workshop, we are also humans. We have to have these conversations for ourselves, with our own families, and our own healthcare providers. We are sharing our experiences and also information with you but we cannot share and are not giving you any direct medical advice, nor are we attempting to do so. Our goal is to give you as much information to make the best decisions possible for yourself and to take any of the information or questions that you have as the result of this workshop session and go directly to your own healthcare professionals to get any further questions answered. So why does this matter to a hospice to provide this information to you? At Mission Hospice and Home Care, we believe that death is a human experience, not a medical one. And it touches our lives every day with family members and friends and those around us or when we ourselves become seriously or critically ill. We believe that death, dying, and loss are human experiences and that every one of us deserves care for our last days of living aligned with our beliefs, our wishes, and our values. But how can anyone provide care aligned to your wishes, beliefs, and values if we don't know what they are? 
So our hope is that by providing this education, that you can communicate with others so that those around you can provide that care. And as an independent, not-for-profit hospice, we're in a unique position to partner with other agencies in our area. And we initiated and have facilitated a new coalition in our area focused on making sure that everyone in our community has access to this information and can have their conversations with family, friends, and their healthcare professionals. Many of the partners are listed on the back of the Take Charge Toolkit and also on the slides. So people have died since the beginning of time. Why does this matter now? Why do we need to take charge of this area of our lives? Recent surveys have shown that although 90% of the public believe it's important to talk about our end of life wishes, fewer than 30% have done it. We're still avoiding it. We still don't know quite how to bring it up. We might not know all of the information to feel confident to do so. Most people find end of life discussions uncomfortable. When asked why, the four most common answers were, I have too many things to worry about right now. I don't want to think about death and dying. My loved one does not want to talk about death and it's a long way off. Surveys also show that nearly 90% of physicians aren't comfortable starting this conversation with their patients. And yet patients and family members think that when it's the right time, their doctor will bring it up to them. What we've learned is that by learning this information and making an appointment with your physician, you can bring it up and then you can open this conversation with them. And right now we're filming this workshop during a pandemic and COVID-19 has really raised the awareness of people wanting to know how they can have a say in their care if something suddenly were to make it so that they weren't able to speak for themselves or they were suddenly rushed to emergency. Would your family, would those around you know what would matter most to you? Finally, what many people don't realize is that healthcare professionals are required by law to do everything possible to sustain life in an emergency situation. And this sounds like what we would all want, but what people don't realize is that doing everything medically possible to sustain life may not be doing everything possible to sustain the quality of life that you would choose. Studies have shown in California that 75% of the public would prefer quality over quantity of life, but they don't realize that without taking charge of this area, having these conversations and documenting their wishes, they are leaving that to chance. It's also easier in common sense to learn new things and make difficult decisions before a crisis. When you're in the midst of a crisis, unfortunately, that's when most people are having these conversations right in the emergency room or at the side, bedside of an ICU. That's not the right time to have these conversations. I help patients in a hospital fill out advanced directives. Every time I walk into a patient's room armed with my clipboard, I feel I'm doing it all wrong. Is this the right time for the gentleman who's about to undergo open heart surgery in the morning to be thinking about his advanced directive? And how about that lady who's getting ready for a bone marrow transplant? Planning ahead can not only ensure your wishes will be known so people can act in your best interest, but it can also relieve your loved ones from guessing about what would matter most. And I can say as an adult daughter, for both of my parents, being able to honor their last wishes as hard as it was to see them in their final days made the difference between knowing and being in chaos with family members and the healthcare team. And we were all able to rally around what mattered most for their last days. So what is advanced care planning? The topic of this course, many people think it's just a form. It's something you go to an attorney for, or it's something that you fill out in the hospital. Advanced care planning is actually a process. And this process for some can take time to learn all you want to learn and know in order to complete, yes, the necessary documents. But it's also a tool 
that can help tell others what would matter most for you if you can't speak for yourself. And as I mentioned, it's a profound opportunity. Although we often avoid wanting to do this, wanting to sit down and do it, learn it, fill out the forms, have these conversations, many people express what a relief it is to finally have it done and to be able to know that those around them can honor their wishes if an emergency took place. It's much more than a form. But the form is also a piece of it, and the form is called an Advanced Healthcare Directive. The Advanced Healthcare Directive is the written document after the process, as part of the conversations, the written document that systems need in order to legally designate who you would like to speak for yourself and also give guidance as to the kind of care that you would or wouldn't choose for your own care. And if you haven't learned enough already from this as to why it's important to you, why do you need one? Anyone 18 years of age or older actually should have a completed advanced healthcare directive. And the reason is that at 18 years of age, you're legally an adult. And the healthcare system, by law, cannot share your medical information with another adult once you are of legal age. So designating who you would like to speak for yourself in case of an accident or emergency, even as an 18-year-old, is important to do. Now your choices and your decisions might be very different if you're 18 years of age or if you're 80. And this document and process can change over time. But the key is that you have something in place in case of emergency. It's the only way that you can really ensure your wishes will be known for those in a potential position to support what matters most for your care. And the key to understand about this is that the only time this will be used is if you cannot speak for yourself. Many people are concerned if they put something in writing or if they speak to their doctor about this, it will shift their care from that moment on. That is absolutely not the case. So long as you can speak for yourself, your healthcare decisions are yours. The advanced care planning and advanced directives are truly like an umbrella in case of emergency but it's one that more of us than we think will actually one day need. So the four simple steps in the Take Charge process that we will share with you. Step one, think about what matters most to you. Step two, talk about your wishes with your family, friends, and healthcare providers. Step three, choose your healthcare agent the person or people that you would choose to make decisions if you were not able to speak for yourself. And finally, the documents. Write it down and make sure those plans are shared with those in a position to support your care. So let's start with step one. Think about what matters most to you and what kind of care you would want for yourself if you were unable to speak for yourself. This is the first step because we can't make medical decisions or choices unless we know what's most important to us. So we want to start here. How would you define quality of life for you? What do you value about your life? So take a moment and think about this statement. What makes life worth living for me. Most people would assume that those around us, our family, our friends, would know our answers to these questions, but that's not always true. So we really want to make sure that we start with what's important to us, because this varies from person to person. And if we want care that aligns with our values and our wishes, then we need to know what our values and our wishes are. We determine quality of life for ourselves. It's not the same for any two people. And so the things that we want to think about when we're determining what's important to us and what quality of life means to us might include our past experiences with serious illness or with death. If you saw a close family member or a friend 
die or experience a serious illness, what went well and what didn't go so well, that's probably gonna shape how you think about what means the most to you and what's important if you were facing a serious illness or death. Your spiritual or religious beliefs are also gonna play a big part of this. How you feel about your faith, your values, what sorts of religious practices you might want, and how your spiritual beliefs impact quality of life and value of life for you. That's gonna make a difference also, as well as your culture. What are those practices that are most important to you? What are your experiences with healthcare? How do you wanna be treated? What does your family value? And so along with that, what are your family dynamics? Who are the people that are most important to you? And when we talk in step three about choosing your healthcare agent, this is really gonna come into play because not every family is going to interact the same way, is gonna make decisions in the same way. So when you're thinking about what's important to you, who's gonna make decisions for you, and how you're gonna make decisions, you wanna think about how is this gonna impact my family? And that might mean your biological family, it might mean your family of choice and your friends, but those people that are really important to you and people that are a part of your life. And then think about any moral or ethical considerations that you have. How do you view end of life? How do you view healthcare decisions? All of those are gonna play into what do you consider important and what values do you have? And sometimes this can be really hard to think about. So there are some great resources out there that can help us name some of these wishes and values that might be important to us. So what you're seeing right now are cards from a game called Go Wish. It was developed by the CODA Alliance. And basically you've got a deck of 36 cards that describe how people wanna be treated, who they want with them, and what matters most to them if they were facing a serious illness or facing end of life. So some of the kind of wishes and values that you see named on the cards are to be free from pain not being connected to machines, being kept clean, having my decisions honored, to be prayed for, or to die at home. So you can see how your religious beliefs might play into this, um, your choices of being around family, that might be part of this as well. But knowing what's important to you and what you value is gonna help shape what sort of medical treatments or interventions you might want or not want. So if these cards feel like they're helpful for you to help shape and be able to name what's really important to you when you think about quality of life, you can access the cards, but you can also find them online at gowish.org. And so kind of like a game of solitaire, you can play the cards and see the full deck and all the different options and then be able to decide, are these very important to you? Maybe a little important or not important and shouldn't be included as the basis for making decisions. So gowish.org is one place where you can get more tools to be able to name what your wishes and values are when you're thinking about what sorts of care you might want when you have a serious illness or when you're facing end of life. So as we're looking at how do we take these wishes and values and try and align them with different medical care, we need to have a better understanding of medical language so that we know how to make sure our wishes and our values align with any sorts of medical treatments or interventions. And when we talk a little bit later about writing it down in step four, you'll see more of these terms when you're looking at the advanced healthcare directives and the pulsed forms. But let's talk about what some of those options are that you'll see on those forms in terms of the medical language that's used to look at these options for care. And the first that you'll often see is do everything you can. And what this usually means is when there aren't cures, 
when there isn't a treatment that is going to cure you from a particular illness or condition, do you want to have medical interventions used that will try and prolong your life? And these interventions generally include CPR, intubation or ventilation, and artificial feeding. So let's talk a little bit more about what those actually mean and what they look like. So cardiac compressions are what you'll see when someone's heart stops and you'll see somebody pumping on their chest above their heart to try and get their heart to start beating again or to keep up the blood flow while they try and revive you. Intubation is a medical intervention where they insert a tube into your airway to help make sure that your airway is free and to help you breathe. And then ventilation is the process where a machine breathes for you. So they connect the machine to a tube through your airway to help you breathe if you are not able to breathe for yourself. CPR is probably the most common one, and it's the one where there's often some misconceptions about what it actually means. Despite what we see on TV, um, when they attempt CPR to help you when your heart stops beating, it's not as successful as what we usually see. 85% of patients in the hospital will still die despite CPR. And obviously these are patients in the hospital, so there are some other underlying health conditions or something going on with them. But that's not as high of a success rate as what we usually expect it will be. And when we add in an advanced illness like cancer or kidney disease, we see those rates get even worse. And about 95% of patients with those advanced illnesses will not survive despite having CPR attempted. This is obviously gonna vary depending on your age, your health, what other medical conditions you might have. So when you're thinking about, are these interventions that are appropriate for me? Is this something that I would want? You need to ask those questions about what's the likely success and impact based on my health. The other kind of end of the spectrum is allow a natural death. And allow a natural death means do not attempt to prolong my life with medical interventions. That care is gonna focus more on managing your symptoms and managing your pain. It's gonna focus on comfort care as opposed to focusing on extending or prolonging your life when there is not a cure available. And this is the approach that palliative care and hospice care will take. So let's talk a little bit about what those terms are because they're not always very clear and they're not always terms that people have heard about. So hospice and palliative care really focus on quality of life versus quantity of life. Their goal is not to try and make people live longer with medical interventions like CPR or intubation or ventilation, but the care is focused on relieving symptoms. So symptoms like pain or shortness of breath or other discomfort. But that's really their goal, is to focus on the, that symptom management. Palliative care and hospice care can be requested. Some doctors will bring it up and suggest it as an option, but it's always something you can ask for. And just to find out, is it appropriate for me right now? Is this a good fit? And it can be a good way to start that conversation with your doctor about what care best fits with what values you have and what matters to you most. So hospice is a subset of palliative care. It's a part of palliative care that is provided for people in the last six months of their life. It is paid for by Medicare and it can be delivered to people wherever they live. So you can receive a hospice when you are at home, when you're at a skilled nursing facility or assisted living facility. It's delivered wherever you are. There are some hospice facilities that people will go to, but most people receive hospice wherever they were living at that time. So to help understand it a little bit more, we'll look at this visually. Curative care is the type of care that we're getting if we're receiving maybe chemotherapy, or we're getting kidney dialysis, or we're getting a surgery for some sort of tumor or other medical condition that we have. 
And palliative care, again, is gonna focus on quality of life and symptom management. And sometimes they'll overlap a little bit. Somebody getting chemotherapy might also receive services from palliative care to help them manage those symptoms, maybe the pain related to a bone cancer. Um, so it is possible to receive both of those. The availability of palliative care is going to vary. Most hospitals will have a palliative care service, but whether it's available in your community outpatient settings or in a clinic is gonna depend on where you live and it's gonna depend on your insurance coverage. So it's always something you need to talk through with your doctor, reach out to your insurance about, to see if it's something that is available to support your care, whether you're receiving curative treatments or if you've reached a point where you're choosing not to actively treat a health condition but are really trying to focus just on the symptom management. And then you'll see that hospice care is that subset of palliative care. It's when people have chosen not to seek curative treatments or seek treatments to try and extend their life. But again, it's just focus on people who are in those last six months of their life to the best that the doctors can say. They're not always able to give an exact amount of time that somebody has left, but to the best of their knowledge, if they feel somebody is in their last six months, then hospice might be appropriate. So all hospice is a type of palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. So we've talked about the two options of prolong my life, do everything you can to help me live longer, or allow a natural death if I've reached that point where curative treatments don't feel like they align with what my wishes and values are. But how do you actually make those decisions? Because it's not always clear cut. We can't plan for every eventuality that we might face. We don't know what illnesses we might get, what sort of accidents might happen to us. So we can't plan for every type of treatment that we might face and that we might have to make a decision about. But the more we know what's important to us, the more we can use that information to evaluate those medical decisions when they do come up. And if we have somebody else making those decisions for us, the better equipped they will be to make decisions that reflect our wishes and our values. What we wanna do is talk with our doctors, talk with our healthcare providers about what would this intervention mean for me based on my health, based on my medical conditions. What would this look like if I had this treatment, if I had CPR, if I went on a ventilator, if I used a feeding tube? What would that look like based on my health? Will I die if I don't have it? And along with that, how long would I want to stay on life support? So if we think about patients maybe with ALS, who at a certain point are not able to breathe on their own and will need to go on a ventilator. For them, the answer is, if I didn't go on the ventilator, then I would die probably fairly soon. For somebody else with a condition where they go on a ventilator, the goal might be that they come off of it and are able to breathe on their own. That's gonna influence whether you feel like this is a decision that you want to make or not. So these are the conversations you need to have. But knowing what's important to you and what you value is gonna help inform those decisions. So how do my medical conditions affect the outcomes? Will I regain my current level of functioning? If I have this surgery, am I gonna come out of it and go back to life as it was before? Or am I less likely to be as mobile or as independent? What are those best and worst case scenarios? It can be a hard one for doctors and, and healthcare providers to answer, and they're not always comfortable with answering those questions because they don't know for sure, but they're good conversations to have when you're considering what treatments are available to you and whether those are ones that you would want or not want. Because you want to know how do they impact what quality of life means to me. So when you know what's important to you, what you value, you can then use that information to evaluate whether any sort of medical intervention or any treatment 
feels like the right decision for you. And you don't have to try and figure out or guess what types of treatments you might be faced with in the future because you know what's important to you and it gives you that foundation to make those decisions. And it also gives you that foundation to have conversations with other people. Other people who might need to step in and make decisions for you if you're not able to make them for yourself. So hopefully this gave you a little bit more of a foundation to understand what's important to you, what you value as you're thinking about your life, if you were faced with a serious illness or towards the end of your life. And these are things that are gonna change over time. What you see as important when you're 28 is probably gonna be very different than when you're 78. And it's gonna be also different if you're 38 and have advanced cancer. These things change over time, which means we need to be revisiting this conversation. We need to be revisiting um, these ideas about what matters to us most and what's important and what do we consider quality of life so that we have an accurate foundation to make these decisions about what sort of medical interventions or treatments we might want. So now that you've hopefully thought a little bit more about what's important to you, we'll be able to talk more about how do we share this information with those people who are important to us and who might make those decisions on our behalf? Step two is talking to your family, friends, and doctors about what's important to you if you are facing a serious medical crisis. How many of you have spoken to the people that you care about most about what's important if you are seriously ill or in an accident. If you haven't, many of us have not. It took my parents becoming ill for me to really understand how important these conversations are. I had a stroke in 2016. In less than an hour, I was in the emergency room of the local hospital and the MRI and other test results were in. We need to administer a drug and there's a 6% chance it will kill you. What do you want us to do? The doctor asked. The decision was easy for me to make. If you had to make a similar decision regarding a medical intervention for a loved one in an emergency health situation, how would you decide? This is what we need to talk about. So now that you've thought about your wishes and who you might want to talk to, how do you start the conversation? Well, you can start by saying, um, you know, I attended this conference and the facilitators are really encouraging us to talk to the people that we love about what might matter to us if we were facing a serious chronic illness. Or you could say, you know, I'm feeling okay now, but in, you know, in the future things might change. And could I share with you how I feel about the wishes that, or things that I would like if I weren't able to speak for myself and I was facing a serious chronic illness. It can be hard to figure out how to open the conversation. I remember getting my husband to start talking with me about it when I was telling him about a woman I had just met whose husband had died recently. She painfully described the emotional fights she'd had with her own children as he lay unconscious in the hospital. The kids wanted aggressive treatment stopped so their dad could rest comfortably, and the wife couldn't bear to let her husband go. I was horrified and frightened by her descriptions of yelling and tears at the bedside. I told my husband I couldn't bear the thought of that happening to our family. And that got us talking. There are also wonderful programs and kits that can help you start the conversation. One of these wonderful kits is called the, the Conversation Project. And in this, they ask questions helping prompt you to answer and decide some of the things that might be important to you, some of your wishes, who you might want to talk to. I used it and it really helped me to decide who I wanted to talk to and some of the wishes that I might like to talk to them about. 
Another wonderful program is the Stanford Letter Project. In it, they help you write a letter to your doctor, your family, your friends, about things that are important to you, how you want to be treated, what might, ha what might you want to have happen if you were facing a serious illness or the end of your life. And I also used that, that program, and it was a wonderful way for me to decide the things that were important to me and what I wanted to say to my family and friends, and even for my doctor to know. Step three, choosing a healthcare agent, someone to speak for you if you are unable to. Choosing your healthcare agent. Your healthcare agent be, should be someone who knows your wishes and values, will respect your wishes even if they don't agree with them, and is a strong healthcare advocate for you who could speak to medical professionals about your conditions and your treatments and can be calm in a crisis. The most important part about choosing your agent is the conversation that you have with them, making sure that they understand what's most important to you uh, and how that you want to be treated. Legally, you can only choose one healthcare agent, and this is really important because the medical profession professionals will really prefer speaking to one person. But it's really important that all the people that care about you and love you know what your wishes are so that everyone can be in consensus when it comes to making the decisions that are important for you. I'm part of a large multicultural family and I'm a stepmom to four adult children. In tough times, differences in cultural traditions and values might have torn us apart. But after my husband became ill, we had learned to talk to each other about what quality of life meant to him and to share those values with our children and our extended family. In the last days of his life, we were not fractured by doubts about what would he have wanted. We were united in our determination to carry out his wishes. I was helping a patient in the hospital fill out his advance directive with his three adult children standing around his bedside. He pointed to one of them and said, if I'm unable to talk for any reason, Jim is the one I want making decisions for me. If Jim is not around, my daughter Susie is the one I trust. But Mikey here, and I love him to death, he's the one person I would not want making decisions on my behalf. Well, I want to share an experience that I had with my own parents. I'm an only child, and both my mother and father chose me as their health care agent. Um, my father had Alzheimer's, and my mother had diabetes and a heart illness. And for 12 years, they had many, many different times where I had to make health care decisions for them. Unfortunately, they did not have the same conversations with their siblings and other family members. So when I made decisions based on what my parents wanted, many of the family members became angry because they didn't agree with their wishes and what was important to them. And in the end, I, not only did I lose my parents, but I lost the relationships with these extended family members. So these conversations and filling out your advanced directives and making sure that your agent understands what's important to you is the most important and loving thing that you can do for the people that you love. Step four. Write it down, document your decisions, and share your forms with your healthcare agent, your doctor, and your loved ones. So in step four, I'm going to cover with you the documents and how to share them so that people that need to know will have the information that you've now taken the time to learn about and make decisions for yourself. The Advanced Healthcare Directive is the written document after the process 
as part of the conversations, the written document that systems need in order to legally designate who you would like to speak for yourself and also give guidance as to the kind of care that you would or wouldn't choose for your own care. As you document your wishes, there are different forms available to you. The main form is called an advanced healthcare directive. And it's important to know if you're watching this video in California, or if you have family members out of state, or if you are living out of state, that these forms are state specific. So please make sure that whatever state you or a loved one are in, that you are using the appropriate form for your area. What I will cover here today is actually the, the key elements that are in any advanced healthcare directive, but the specifics for your state would be important to capture. Having said that, there are multiple forms, um, which makes it very confusing for the public. In California alone and nationally, there are multiple versions of advanced healthcare directives. You can find some online, you can find one on our website. The difference between these forms is actually the level of detail about your wishes and values. Some of the more personal information you might want to include. Some of them have more space for information about burial plans and things beyond your care at the end of life. The form you use is up to you. The legal aspects of the forms is what I will cover today. And just make sure that any form that you are using is actually a legal document in the state that you are in. So using the California Health Care Directive as our base form for this session. Part one on your advanced health care directive is the most important element of your advanced health care directive. It is where you designate who your health care agent will be, who that person is that you chose in step three, who will make decisions on your behalf if you are unable to do so yourself. Your healthcare agent name, address, phone number, contact details is the first step in any healthcare directive. And this is the only legally binding aspect of your advanced healthcare directive. It allows the healthcare teams to legally share medical information so that your healthcare agent can make decisions on your behalf in case you aren't able to speak for yourself. There's also a space on the form for two alternates. Legally, there is only one designee at a time that the healthcare teams can go to in case of emergency. But none of us knows what that timing might be of when we might need someone to be called upon. So it's highly recommended that you add two alternates and just know that if the first is unable or unwilling for whatever reason at the time they would need to be called upon, the healthcare teams would then go to your second option and then your third. The second part on an advanced healthcare directive after you've named your healthcare agent is the guidance that you would give the healthcare teams and your agent about what matters most for your care. At a very high level on the legal documents, there are two choices that align very much to what we shared in step one in the medical decision making. Do everything you can, regardless of the quality of life. Do any, everything you can to sustain life, and that's the direction, high level, that you would like to give medical teams. Or allow a natural death. Allow comfort care. Allow death to take its natural course if you were in a situation where the medical teams felt that you were dying or you were so seriously ill and unconscious that the likelihood of the burden versus the benefit of treatments would mean that you would most likely die within a short period of time. Those areas of guidance are there on your advanced health care directive and they are extremely broad. So there are details that you can add to that decision making in lines under section two on your healthcare directive. 
and you can put as much detail as you would choose. You can attach forms from the, the things that you've learned in this workshop. You can write notes, anything that would might, might help the guidance for your healthcare decision making. So step one, name your healthcare agent. Step two, give medical guidance as to the care or treatment you would or wouldn't want in case you weren't able to speak for yourself. Sections three and four on healthcare directives in the state of California cover organ donation wishes, organ and tissue donation in step three. This is an optional area and in the state of California that is also covered on a driver's license program um, and you may have designated already your wishes to be or not to be an organ or tissue donor elsewhere. But there is an optional space on your healthcare directive to also note that. There is also an optional space to name your primary physician at the time. If you are currently under care and you want to make sure that a physician who is caring for you is known immediately by emergency health care teams, you can designate that there. Both of these se sections are optional, but they are there for you. Section five is the third essential component of your advanced health care directive. The first section, name your health care agent. The second, give guidance as to the care or treatment you would or wouldn't want if you were nearing the end of your life. And section five, make sure this document is witnessed. You do not need an attorney to witness this document, you can do it yourself. But there are two options to having the document witnessed. One is having two witnesses witness your signature on the form. The witnesses are witnessing your signature, not the content of the form. So you want to make sure not to sign and complete your form unless you are in the presence of two witnesses. The other option is to have a notary witness your signature, and there's a place on the form to do that. And you can look up in your area if there are notaries who can either you can go to or they can come to you. For the two witness option, friends, neighbors, could even be an acquaintance, um, is just witnessing that you are actually signing the form. And in so doing, it's important to note that the witness cannot be anyone on your healthcare team, and the witness can also not be your healthcare agent so that it's an independent source for witnessing your advanced directives. I have heard um, very sad stories about people who completed their advanced directives but never had them witnessed. And the legal aspect of naming your healthcare agent does not hold unless your document is witnessed. So make sure not to skip that step. So finally, what happens if you don't have an advanced healthcare directive? What happens is that doctors who may not know you will make healthcare decisions for you in case of emergency. And they are guided by laws and regulations to do everything they can to save life, um, sustain life for as long as possible, whether that is the quality of life you would choose or not. And secondly, doctors will have to refer to family members, anyone that they can find that may have known what your wishes were but if your family members don't know, and if you haven't designated a healthcare agent, it can add to the chaos and uncertainty and real grief of people not knowing what you would have wanted. So ask yourself, in case of emergency, do people know what matters to me? And would they be able to honor and communicate my wishes? Now we've completed the basics of an advanced healthcare directive, and just to make it interesting, there is one more form. In the state of California, this is called a POLST form, a Physician Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. And it has a very significant yet different purpose from the Advanced Healthcare Directive. As I mentioned, in the Advanced Healthcare Directive, you are naming your healthcare agent, the person who can speak for you, in case you are in the hospital and cannot speak for yourself. The Advanced Healthcare Directive is guidance for hospital professionals, hospital personnel, from the emergency room onwards. 
the physician order for life-sustaining treatment, or the POLST form, is a form that tells emergency personnel before you get to the hospital, if you were suddenly to take seriously ill, to have a heart attack, to stop breathing at home, and if you are currently living with a serious illness or a chronic condition where you know that there might be the possibility that this could happen at home, you would want to talk with your physician about completing a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. This document, separate from the Advanced Healthcare Directive, must be completed by your physician. As it says in the name, it is a physician order. Your physician is placing an order for any emergency personnel, if they were to enter your home, to follow the physician's orders according to your wishes. This is a document and a conversation that you have specifically with your physician, and the form was developed specifically for those who are living with a serious or uh, critical illness and want to make sure their wishes would be honored before they get to the hospital in case of emergency. This in California is a hot pink form, and with all of our te technology and services available, what emergency personnel are trained to do in the case of emergency is to look on your refrigerator door. And if this hot pink form is there, they know immediately to look at it and care accordingly. Without the form, they are required to do all of the medical interventions that were mentioned in step one of CPR, resuscitation, and into the emergency room, the possibility of ventilation if that is needed to support your breathing. Again, the advanced directive and the POLST form are state specific, and they may have different names. So please look in your own state to make sure that your advanced healthcare directive and any physician orders for outside of the hospital can be completed and accessed by those who need it. And the last part of step four, once you've written these things down, once you've completed the forms, you need to make sure that people know where they are. You need to make sure that people can access this information in case of emergency. Unfortunately, too often, we find out after someone who is, has died that their family members find a completed form in a file drawer. They'd never talked about it. They didn't know how to honor their wishes. Or they have completed an advanced health care directive that's with an attorney but it's not in their medical records. So ensuring and taking charge of this area of your life also means making sure that these forms are where they need to be. First, you wanna share your plans. You wanna talk with your healthcare agent to make sure that they know your decisions and if they were faced with a physician and this form, that they would be able to understand what your thought processes were. You want to make sure that you schedule an appointment with your physician and talk with them about this document and request that it be put in your electronic or filed medical records so that in case of emergency, it is known that you have completed this. In the Take Charge Toolkit, there are also tips on how you can talk to your doctor about this. And currently, in the United States, physicians are reimbursed specifically for having this conversation with you. So it's a good idea to schedule a specific appointment with them and go over these documents. For some healthcare systems, they will request that you put this information into a form in their electronic system. All of the information you will have compiled can be put into any format, but just make sure that if you have a system that requests this in their own form that you do so in the format that they request. Finally, you want to make sure that family and friends, anyone who might be contacted or anyone who you have chosen to be part of your um, care support circle, if you were seriously ill, have this conversation with them. Let them know where your documents are. Let them know the things that matter most for your care and how they may or may not be able to um, be part of supporting what matters for your end-of-life care. 
Again, the toolkit has some more information and tips on how to start these conversations with your family, friends, and healthcare professionals. And once you have shared these documents and had these conversations, just like a will, these things can change over time. You may have designated someone to be your health care agent five, ten years ago who is no longer living or no longer able for whatever reason to be able to be your health care agent. So the cycle of thinking about what matters most, talking about it with others, choosing your health care agent and writing it down and sharing your plans is a continual cycle. This is a living document. It's there in case of emergency. So every year or five years, you might want to update this and make sure that anyone who has a copy has the updated copy. So in order to take charge, there are really four simple steps. Think about what matters most to you. Talk about it with your family, friends, and healthcare provider. Choose your healthcare agent, the person you'll designate to make decisions for you if you can't speak for yourself and write it down and share your plans. Completing an advance directive is important, but for my husband and I, that task was simply a catalyst for learning to communicate with each other, with family, and with his medical team. It helped us to communicate who he was, what he cared about, and how he wanted to live. At the end of his life, it was these conversations that guided and comforted me through those tough decisions that I had to make. A friend told me, we, his family, knew dad's wishes for medical treatment at the end of life. And the doctors and nurses treated us as peers, partners, confidants, and most importantly, as our dad's voice. Dad was at peace and in comfort knowing that we were his safe haven. We are smiling today, secure in the knowledge that we did our best for dad, and he knew that. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is much more than a form. It's a conversation, it's a process, and it's an area that we hope you now feel more confident to take charge of in your life and for your last days of living. And having gone through this content, we're very aware that you might want more information or resources and support. And this final slide gives you access to that from all of our agencies. We thank you for taking charge.